this year. I'm going to take a moment to let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they do. Okay, hey guys, my name is Todd Harris, and I'm from a local game studio, High Res Studios. We're just up the road in Alpharetta. And um, in February, we released an MMO called Global Agenda. Who's heard of it? Global Agenda? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your support. Um, thanks for supporting Georgia Gaming. So Global Agenda is an MMO, but it's a shooter MMO. So we definitely uh, took some liberties with some of the traditional conventions. And uh, it's often sometimes controversial whether it's categorized legitimately as an MMO or not. So, um, But I think it's a pretty exciting uh, indication of where MMOs are going. So happy to talk with you guys about uh, MMOs in general today. Thanks for having me. So my name is Brian Green. Uh, I'm often known by my pseudonym PsychoChild Online. Uh, I used to run the game Meridian 59. I started in the industry in 98, so I truly am one of the long beards of the industry. Um, not the oldest, thankfully, but uh, uh, last year I uh, shut down the company that was running Meridian 59, unfortunately, but the uh, game continues on in the hands of the original developers. Uh, these days I do more consulting contract work. I write a blog at psychochild.org. And uh, one of my newest uh, projects has been writing about cyberpunk on a site called the internetcrash.com. My name is Linda Carlson, and I, I have the privilege of manning the community department for Sony Online Entertainment. We have 15 staffers. We brought uh, myself and five others here. Minions, hold up your hands. Yes. <laughs> That's just in case you heckle me too much. Uh, however, today I'm here also as my alter ego, Brass the Dwarf, and uh, uh, partially signed up to heckle Brian. Uh, SOE has quite a number of MMOs, as you might know, and a number more on the way. We've got all sorts of things going on, so really, really happy to be here at DragonCon to talk about them. And unlike last year, this is actually a little bit more freeform. We're going to take a lot of questions from the audience. Um, that said, I'm going to start you guys off with one. We're, so we've just seen Global Agenda go to a, an alternate payment model, which is more towards a free-to-play. Well, actually, it's a Guild Wars model, um, where you buy it and you get to play it and enjoy it. And then you can buy other stuff, which is fun. Um, Meridian 59 has gone free to play, although well, you have it's, it's gone free. It's no longer being run as a subscription service, a right. commercial game anymore. So basically you can sign up for free. Yeah. When we ran it commercially, it was a subscription-based game, but I really wanted to do another business model. The only reason we kind of kept with subscriptions is because the game had been running for about six years when we picked it up. Right. On subscriptions, that's kind of what people expected. So okay, I I'll hold the rest of that because yeah. I'm getting to it. <laughs> We've seen EverQuest 2 go to EverQuest 2 Extended, and they have uh, Free Realms, which Pex is involved in, and does great, great business. And I'm my question, first question, actually also Cartoon Network has just rolled Fusion Fall to free to play. So my question is, how ubiquitous is this in the industry, and how much of a trend do you think this is going to become? I'm so glad you decided to start with one of our most controversial topics at SOE. Uh, as you mentioned, Free Realms has been a free-to-play model for some time. So is uh, Clone Wars Adventures, which is now an open beta. And uh, SOE is constantly evaluating monetization processes. One of the reasons we decided to add free, a free-to-play version of EQ2 was because people were asking for it. A lot of people now, they come to panels on, on games that we're developing and they say, how come you're doing this as a subscription model? I'm not paying that much a month. I want free to play and buy what I want to when I want to. So it's a matter of adapting to the marketplace and trying to find ways to satisfy the people who want to go that method. With EQ2, I'll tell you right now, we all recognize it's a grand experiment and we're taking a lot of feedback because um, we, we still maintain the regular live subscription service in addition to the free to play. And I think it's very worthwhile to uh, find out what your audience wants and, and try to serve it to them. Uh, I completely agree. Like I was saying, I, I really wanted to do no, another business model from Meridian 59, but it's a question of what the players expected. Uh, you know, when we re when we uh, brought Meridian 59 back, it was for the you know, hardcore fans. Um, I really think that uh, kind of talking to the ubiquity, you know, what the future is. I think that this business model is going to be the you know pretty much the future. There's always going to be room for big, triple A, big name uh, MMOs, subscription-based MMOs. So you know, don't worry if you don't like the free-to-play model. You know, there's always they're always going to be around. You know, obviously Sony makes a lot of money off of them. Blizzard makes a lot of money off of them. It, if you're looking for a big name, high budget MMO, those are going to be around. Don't worry about it. 
I think where it really shines through is you know basically on uh, products that couldn't survive necessarily in that type of environment, or you know basically smaller you know like uh, you know a lot of games I know of you know they have you know instead of like millions of people they have thousands of people, and you know it, it, these games are really great. There's a, a passionate fan base for these games. But one of the things I explained is, you know, from the business point of view, is you know, if I have say 10,000 people, uh, and you know, a, a subscription base has 10,000 people, you know, they're making 10 bucks a month. I'm making 10 bucks a month. They're making 15, you know, 15 bucks a month. Or you know, let me start over again. Sorry, it's, it's early. So uh, <laughs> if I have I have, have 10,000 people and I'm making 10 dollars a month, and let's say World of Warcraft has two million people in North America and they're making 10 bucks a month, 15 bucks a month. The amount of money that we're making is completely different, but in the eyes of the consumer, it's exactly they're paying almost the same amount. So I can't compete with that. If I'm making, if I have a small MMO, I can't compete with World of Warcraft. I have to look at some other business model. The nice thing about the free-to-play business model is you can try the game for free and see basically like an extended uh, 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 trial. But people who really love the game that say this game gives me exactly what I want, that might be a very small group. They can pay me a lot of money and keep the game going, and you know other people can enjoy it for free. Yeah, I think um, some of the nice things about free-to-play or, or buy-to-play, um, but buy-to-play with a trial, is it does let the consumers have more choices. So everyone's got a lot of uh, a lot of different ways to spend their money right now, and their and their time, and their time is limited as much as their money. So um, free-to-play is actually interesting because I think it's good for the genre because it lets experiments get out there and see what's successful. So the global agenda, we looked at how people played the game. We actually designed it so it could be played kind of in bite-sized units of fun, and so we saw that. Um, even though we were initially floating the subscription model, we never ended up charging anyone. Um, we would just kind of continually survey the community and see what they were interested in. And basically, a lot of people play it as their second MMO. It's not their full MMO. They have another MMO and they enjoy it um, for the instance to instant gameplay. So we looked at a model that matched how people wanted to play it. That was buy to play. And, uh, and I think a lot of the industry is moving that way, although I agree with the other panelists. It's not the death of the subscription, but you really have to have a crap load of content at this point um, for people to uh, pay a subscription. Okay, and just uh, really quick, Mario has joined us from Cartoon Network, uh, if you'd yeah. like to grab your mic. But, but first, we'll just tell you that uh, the question is, advanced calculus and how it applies to class balance. Go! <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that's a really good question, I might use that next. Um, <laughs> No, I was going to say, if you want to introduce yourself, but the question is, uh, with your game having now gone to a free-to-play model, how do you think this is going to affect the industry, and how has it affected your game? Oh, okay, so, hi, I'm Mario Piedra. I'm the art director on Fusion Fall, the Cartoon Network uh, Universe MMO. Um, so, uh, free-to-play, uh, yeah. So, we had originally started a subscription, um, but really, it, the Switch came, uh, what, earlier last year, and... For us, it really just became about our particular corner of the market, especially getting kids, um, where their subscription money, we just, it, we were doing pretty well, but we wanted to try something else, and now merging together with the rest of Cartoon Network Digital just became a bigger possibility for the marketing and ad sales sort of uh, revenue instead of the subscription. <coughs> because kids were just, it's just a hard place to tackle for money. Okay, sorry about that. Um, there's a really loud air vent, so people back here couldn't hear. Could you move that air vent up here? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Um, okay, so does anybody, we're going to open it up at this point. Anyone have any questions for our lovely panelists on how the MMO industry is going? If there's no questions, Linda's going to start singing, so. <laughs> so you got to give her a fast. <laughs> I notice a lot a developers will be on one game then another and another do you not have non-competition agreements within the industry or do they have to wait a certain amount of time or what it depends on why they leave <laughs> uh, and that's actually a true answer uh, sometimes that will be written into their uh, departure contracts uh, especially if they're laid off but uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that anyone who's a developer on the uh, on the game also signs massive non-disclosure forms for proprietary information that belongs to their previous company and, and so 
Um, no, there's no. I, th this is actually, the games industry is the most incestuous industry that I know of. People are back and forth all the time. It ends up that you know people in almost every company that you've worked with over the years. It, it's really quite interesting. <laughs> Who else wants to talk? No, uh, and uh, from a legal point of view, uh, just to preface this, I'm not a lawyer. This isn't legal advice. Uh, 